that's what all the people say You're riding high in April Shot down in May But I know I'm gonna change that tune Bei der Arbeit für richtig hält's Ob du glaubst, dass ich fleißig gewesen bin Dass ich gearbeitet habe Dass ich mich in diesen Jahren für dich eingesetzt habe Dass ich anständig meine Zeit verwendet habe im Dienste meines Volkes. Gib du jetzt deine Stimme ab. Wenn ja, dann tritt für mich ein, so wie ich für dich eingetreten bin. Well, there you have another episode of Straight Outta Combat Radio, Audio Medicine by Green Zone Hero. Today's guest, is a little bit different from those we've had in the past. He is the son of a Holocaust survivor. His name is Joey Korn. His father, Abram Korn, survived the ordeal, made it to the United States. It's a compelling story, very powerful. The will of the human spirit is something we cannot measure. But I can tell you this, Joey's dad had great heart and a great love for America. I thank you for listening to this episode of Straight Outta Combat Radio. Your steely-eyed killer shadow in the night You were born to fight You gotta light them up My name is John Krotek, and I want to welcome you to Straight Outta Combat Radio, audio medicine by Green Zone Hero. We're here to honor the wisdom of America's most valuable asset for combat veterans. We're authentic, we're empowering, we're American. Our guest for this episode of Straight Out of Combat Radio is Mr. Joseph Korn of Augusta, Georgia. This story today is a little bit different from the stories we've had in the past. Joey's the son of Abram Korn, and Abram Korn is an American citizen who started out his life in Poland. And after a long, horrendous journey through the Nazi concentration camps of World War II, he finally made it to, to our shores, and he certainly lived out the American dream. And Joey and his dad wrote a book called Abe's Story, a Holocaust memoir. In fact, it was written by the account from Abram, but Joey took the story and added to it and made it a really, truly inspiring book, despite some of the horrific things that take place in it. And so I truly believe that Abram Korn is a veteran of a different sort and certainly a veteran of armed conflict and genocide. And it's a story that needs to be told. This is an impactful, hard-hitting story. And I just got to say that I'm extremely honored and humbled to have Abram's son here, Joey, with us on this episode. So Welcome to our podcast, Joey. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and glad you're helping me share Dad's story. Well, my pleasure. I wish I could do more, but, you know, I certainly appreciated the gift. I got it in the mail on Friday. Today's Monday. I finished it in two days. I just couldn't put it down because it was fascinating. And and I it was just marveled at the way that your dad, despite the hardships that he endured, him and his family and millions of others, that he was able to to endure. And what a testimony to his indomitable spirit. What a person, what a man, what an American, what a Jewish person. And I mean, he just exemplified so many good things about humanity in the face of those adverse things that happened to him. But this story is not about me rambling on. It really is about your dad. And, and what I'd like to do is have you start out. Tell us a little bit about your dad and the genesis of the book. Well, dad was raised in Lipno, Poland, which wasn't far from Warsaw. When he was 16, he was the oldest of three children. When he was 16, the very first day of the war, his hometown was attacked. Within a short time, they lost their belongings, their home. They, they had a family-run lumberyard. That, that, this dad would have been the third generation to run that had that come about. But they lost all their possessions, everything. Ended up in a ghetto, and then another ghetto, and then to, and then up to eight, at least eight concentration camps. Dad had this, you know, most of the books you read about the Holocaust, or especially memoirs, really focus on the atrocities, and there were many. Dad mentioned some of this terrible stuff, and he talks about 
what happened to himself and others and how they were treated. But he doesn't focus on it. He focuses on the good. He never lost. He never gave up. He never despaired, or at least didn't express that in the writing. He also never gave up his faith in humanity and mankind and in God. He lost a lot of the Orthodox traditions that he was raised in, but he wanted to be sure to raise his future family, me and my brother and sister, in the Jewish tradition. And you would not know if the people who knew him, only his closest friends, knew he had been through all that. Because he really didn't talk about it. He was just the most loving, gentle, caring human being who was always doing for others. He came over here. He got his first job with what soon became, when I was born, they became my godparents. but. They had a little auto parts store in downtown Augusta, Georgia. They took him in and as an immigrant, but they really saw how amazing, that he was a great worker and a good person. And they took my parents in like their own family. They didn't have children of their own. You know, he helped them grow that business into the largest tiny little auto parts store. It grew into one of the largest distributors of auto parts in our region. Yeah, that's an amazing story. You know, one thing that's interesting is that, you know, reading through the book, your dad seemed to, despite the fact of where he was at in these concentration camps, he always seemed to catch the attention because of his work ethic and probably because of his because of his love for mankind. These perpetrators, despite what they were doing, saw something in him because he managed several different times to fall under the wing or to be seen for his work ethic. And what you just described building the the auto parts store, what doesn't surprise me because in the most horrendous conditions, your dad managed to find work or to want to work. And I think that's pretty extraordinary under the conditions that he went through. He was, (laughs) he was a different guy, but a different human being. For example, when I, I interviewed, Some of the people that he lived with after the war, all of them were survivors, and they were still in Germany, you know, beginning to rebuild their lives. And one of them told me, she said, you know, the rest of us, we just wanted to live off the German government for a while after all they've done to us. We wanted to have fun. We wanted to dance. We wanted to eat good. We wanted to play. And he said, your father was different. He went right to school. He wanted to be an electrical engineer, and he went right to work getting a job as an electrical helper. He was just so different. Now, what you said about other people during the Holocaust, some of the Germans saw the good in him and helped him. I really see the origin of that the other way around. You see, most people in the Holocaust, they believed that all Germans were bad and no Germans were good. And they couldn't see the good in others. Dad knew how to see the good in others and draw it out. You know, as you read the story, you read about good Germans helping Dad from the very beginning to the very end of the story. I mean, he even talked about Nazi SS officers that were sympathizers, that were smuggling in information from the partisans that were out in the woods to the prisoners in Auschwitz. He talked about... There's a whole chapter on good Germans. I bet you that's the only chapter titled Good Germans of any Holocaust memoir ever written. Joe, and you're probably right, and he did. You know, now that you mention it, he did. There's some parts in the book where he talks exactly about those SS officers who were the the most elite Germans in the army. And he, there were some that were sympathetic to him. And that amazed me because even at risk of their own demise, they were able to help your dad in certain ways that probably didn't happen that often. So some reason or another, they did see that in your dad and they understood that it was the right thing to do at that moment. And it probably helped your dad along and it probably kept his faith in humanity to a certain extent. One thing that I've read recently is that 22% of millennials in the U.S. don't even know what the Holocaust is or was, or and that maybe as many as 11% of Americans don't know what it is. And a lot of people think that it was, of course, any one person dying in a genocide is bad enough, but a lot of people think that it was 2 million people or less. And this was a European-wide 
genocide. It wasn't like, I mean, it happened to how many millions of people, 50 million or more. And how do you forget that? The Holocaust, not only, I mean, of course, it wasn't just the Jews. There were 6 million Jews killed, murdered, innocent people. But there were another 5 to 6 million non-Jews, other groups and people who just resisted and people even who helped Jews and for example Jehovah's Witnesses that was another group that was put in the camps and gypsies were put in the camps and anybody that didn't agree with the German way they were either killed or punished in some other way or put into ghettos and camps it affected all of Europe you know one thing that your dad pointed out in the book after he was liberated at Buchenwald with his compatriots he talked about how the fear the fear is just what kept people from standing up and rising up to stop something like this and then we talked about it, it wasn't just in Germany but this was a fear that was european wide i mean these concentration camps were spread out all through europe there's no way that i believe that people didn't know what was going on especially when you see the amount of trains and people going in there and nobody's coming back out or i'm just shocked that they were able to perpetrate this crime against humanity and even though there were people that tried to stand up it's unimaginable that something like this could happen it just is unimaginable i know but you know look at similar things look at things that are other you know around the world today where people are being persecuted because of the way they believe or just for their freedom. They're fighting for freedom, you know, and it's crazy that all this could have happened. And some of it, similar things are still happening. But during the Holocaust, all this was done to the Jews because of the way they think, the way they believe, not because of anything they've done. It's just unimaginable what really happened. And But it also, when you learn more and more about it, it shows the evil that can come out in people. But it also shows the incredible good that can come out in other people. And we all have that potential, and it's up to us to decide how we react to the circumstances of our lives and of what's going on around us. That's a great point, Joey, because it is, it's a choice. And it was amazing how your dad did outline instances in the book where people that at one time were cordial, nice and friendly, but you know, that had turned. And then some people that stayed true to their, their hearts and their minds throughout the whole ordeal. And gosh, you're so right that when you lose freedom and when you lose your food and you lose your families and you lose hope, the depravity of some of the people that he described and the things that they did was unimaginable. And that's really the only word you can say. And yeah, you sometimes wonder, well, what would it be like if I was in that situation or, or how would I respond? And I guess, thank God, none of us will, will probably ever find that out. And it's stories like your dad's that need to be told and, and need to be out there and continue to talk about them so we can try to understand that type of psyche. It's scary. And you're so right, Joey, things that are going on around the world and have gone around the world, what humans do to each other just because of their beliefs is mind boggling at times. I can't personally understand it. And my dad was raised in Pittsburgh and all of his brothers, there were three of them, two of them were in the liberation of Europe. One was a B-17 guy and the other one was infantryman. And then the other one was in Japan, was in Tokyo Bay when the Japanese surrendered. But they were there. They did their part. And I'm proud to say that my grandfather, this was your dad, Abram, but mine came over from Croatia right after World War I. And so he saw genocide with the Ottoman Turks. And and so I don't know, I, I just was raised with a different stamp, I guess, than, than the average Joe, because I love this country like your dad did. And let's talk about that. Let's talk about his love for the country. He talks about it in his book. Well, he does. And even the dedication. From the very beginning, I, I, I'd like to read the dedication. I dedicate this book to my wife, Ellie, who inspired me through the years to succeed in all my undertakings. I also dedicate this book to the memory of Mr. Jack Y. Platzblatt. I came to America as a displaced person. I wanted to succeed in life through my own individual efforts and not from the charity of others. Mr. Platzblatt gave me the opportunity to do just that. I wrote this book because I'm proud to be an American, and I want to show my own children and whoever reads this book why I feel so grateful to be part of this great country, the United States of America. 
I mean, he really loved this country, and he just loved the freedoms that we had. You know, there's a portion after liberation that he wrote this. None but the imprisoned and the oppressed can fully appreciate the meaning of the word freedom. It's the most precious gift of life. Liberty and freedom are both words that glide easily off the tongue, but freedom arrives through much hardship and pain for those who without it. What is freedom? It is incomprehensible. It would take a lifetime to fully express it. And that's what it took him, a lifetime. He expressed the freedom in his lifetime, and we take it for granted here. We complain about this, and we complain about this, and all the political things and all of this and that, but we've got freedom. We can go to the school. We can practice the religion we want, or to, we want to. We can go to school if we want to and go to the schools often that we want to. We can speak out against the government. People around the world in many places around the world can't do that today. Look what's happened in Hong Kong now that was so, they were so free for so long, you know. They were promised their freedom, and now look what's happened. You're totally right. And, you know, what's interesting is is that freedom is something that's difficult at times for people to quantify. And unless they've seen that other side, you're exactly right, Joey. They have a tendency to take it for granted. And I, uh, at times, have to catch myself at times, you know, to stop the complaining, you know. Right. Really? I mean, it's cold today. So, Wow. (laughs) <laughs> Come on, I can put on a jacket, I can put my shoes and my socks, my boots on, and I can go out and I can brave the cold. It's not like my clothing has been taken away from me and I'm standing in the snow somewhere like so many Holocaust prisoners went through. Your dad couldn't have been more eloquent. And I mean, in coming from that side of, of life, absolutely, he understands what it is. I know that when they were liberated at Buchenwald, he talked a lot about how generous the American soldiers were that liberated them, and, and he, he never forgot that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, the military governor was Jewish, and an Orthodox Jew, and he told Dad, somehow he met Dad, took a liking to Dad, and he says, you know, they're putting you, uh, most of you in displaced persons camp, you know, DP camps, and in many ways, e- even though you can come and go, they're not a lot better than where you were. He says, I want you to stay. I'm going to get you, put you in a place where you can live much better. And they kicked some, uh, I think it was SS officers officers out of this boathouse. And they put him and a few other survivors in the boathouse with him. And he just took care of them. And those, I met some of those and taught, interviewed some of them years later when I learned they were still alive when I was finishing the book. They are the ones that gave me those stories, those wonderful stories after liberation with them, living with them. And, the, you know, some very funny stories, you know, and I just had to put them, even though this is an autobiography, I had to put those stories in there. They were true. I learned to write in his voice and I added their stories in, too. You know, one of the funny stories you might remember is this military governor wanted them to be kosher. and. They always did keep kosher before the war, but after the war, they wanted to eat everything. (laughs) They did. Every day, the military governor would bring them a dozen eggs. One of his housemates got so frustrated. All these eggs, these eggs, everyday eggs, and he threw them up in the air, and (laughs) they all smashed on the ceiling. And he says, I'm tired of these eggs. (laughs) And then, you know, the story, they all had just gotten out of the camp. They weren't out of the camps very long, and they're riding on the train in West Germany on the, because they were on the eastern side when they were liberated from Buchenwald. They were allowed to go to the western side, which was the American sector. Right. And one of them said, somebody stole my, my luggage, and he pulled the string that you could pull to stop the train, you know, an emergency. And he said, what have you got in that suitcase to stop a train for? <laughs> You know, we just got out of a concentration camp. So I just had to put those stories in there, you know. It's- no, and, and they're great. One thing that was really nice, and your dad, he definitely had 
an affinity towards the fair sex. And he makes note of that quite a few times in the book, which I thought was really, it made you realize what this young man was going through. And the story about his, what I would call how he met your mom and the love that that both of them had for each other and how that story transpired is, is heart rendering. I mean, I just, it was an amazing story. You know, your mom was Lutheran and your dad had such an effect on her. Not only did he pull her over to the States, but he got her to practice his religion and she loved him. Tell us a little bit about your mom. Oh, she was incredible. Number one, just think how courageous she was. She was a German Lutheran. They met after the war, but her parents really, you know, really loved my dad and my grandparents, of course. She gave up everything to come over here with dad. She she left her family. She left her friends. She met, left her country. She didn't, neither of them spoke English. She gave up everything. And she was like, dad was the disciplinarian in the family. And she was the one that always took care of us, you know, watched over us. You know, they just loved each other dearly. And when, after dad died, he died at such a young age. He died from a, a lung disease that they really didn't understand. It, it was fairly rare or something. It's a type of pulmonary fibrosis, but it's something that's similar to what people get when they uh, breathe asbestos in, you know? Right. He probably did that, repairing rooftops, that the roofs in Auschwitz and Birkenau, that is, the area had been bombed. But I was raised in a wonderful, loving family. And, you know, that's something... I spent many years, several years, really involved with children of survivors, especially through the website that you found me in, I think, remember.org. That's right. And I was in many discussion groups with children of survivors, and I realized there's two kinds of survivors. And it's still the same way in any, it could be soldiers who went through Vietnam, for example. And it's how you survive and how you handle the your life during that time that depended on how you're going to, that, that made how you would survive the rest of your life. Like many of the survivors lost their faith in God. They lost their faith in mankind and they lost their faith in themselves. They grew to raise what we now call dysfunctional families. They were never successful in business or anything like that. But the other group, the group that kept their integrity, their dignity intact, that what they could to help others rather than harm, rather than take from others in order to help themselves. And they grew up with joy, finding joy in the slightest little things that we don't even pay attention to. You know, they grew up to have very successful businesses and whatever the career they went into. They raised warm, loving families. And that was the group dad was in. Thank God. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank God. And I just think that's incredible. You know, if your dad did pass away early, I don't think he reached even 50. And you can't help but think that a lot of the things that he was breathing in in such a horrendous place would not have an effect. And so often these things come back to certainly haunt us. But if your dad were alive today, what would he want people to know about freedom? And what would he want people to know about life itself? If you could speak for your dad. I would just think he would want would remind people how fortunate life is, especially freedom. We talked about earlier, this country, our country, built on freedom. I think what he would tell people is, read my story. He didn't like to talk about the Holocaust to others. He didn't have that victim mentality, you know. But his story shares what I read in the introduction. I want, you know, I want those who read this book to know how wonderful the freedom of our country is. I think one of the messages I bring and my sisters bring in to when we speak, especially in schools, it's so important to educate the kids because they they know nothing about it as a general rule, as you've already mentioned, is the importance of loving your family and expressing that love. When I close my talks, I often say, you know, it doesn't take a Holocaust to take your family from you. Some of you, even kids, already know you might have lost a grandfather or a favorite uncle. And I remind them, you might lose your entire family today in a car wreck. 
And you need to appreciate what you have. You need to appreciate your loved ones, your freedom to go to school, even though sometimes they feel like they're made, of course. They, they say they're being made to go to school. And your freedom, we also say, and tell, tell your loved ones that you love them. Whether it was your brother, your sister, your mother. And, you know, my dad always expressed his love to us. So did my mother. And we do to our children. Now, <laughs> I catch myself hanging up from a phone call with my son. I forgot to say I love you. And on the way to hanging, the phone's going to the receiver. And I can hear him say, I love you, Dad. So it's just, love is just so important. That's awesome because, and it is, I couldn't agree with your dad and you more, Joey, because love overcomes a lot of things and our ability to be able to make choices on how we conduct ourselves. I think you hit upon it. You know, you can choose a couple of different paths based on what you've been through, but the path of love and forgiveness and showing that is certainly the path that I think heals. And how can people find your book, Abe's Story? Where do they need to go to get it? And if somebody wants to ask you a question, how do they get a hold of you? Well, there's a little summary of Abe's Story in in the website. It's real easy to remember the name of it, remember.org. And to go straight to his page or his section of the site, and it's all about Holocaust education, the whole website. But the page that goes straight to that would be remember.org forward slash Abe, A-B-E. But if you just go to remember.org, up in the upper left-hand corner, there's a, a picture of my dad. And you click on that, it'll take you straight to it. You can also get the book through Amazon, but I prefer to put a personalized message and sign each book. And so you can call me. If you order it through remember.org, you actually go, go, you're sent to another website, my other website. But your uh, listeners can feel free to call us here at 706-733-0204 or 877-369-7000. You know, thank you for sharing that information. You know, I, I just want to let listeners know that we our guest today on Straight Out of Combat Radio is Joey Korn, son of Abram Korn. His story, Abe's story, it's his dad's story. The Holocaust memoir is something that is very impactful, something that needs to be told. And I encourage everybody who's listening today, if you want to read a story of the indomitable will of the human spirit, this is one of those stories. And Joey has crafted it in his dad's own words, but with other things in there that make it pretty significant. And I love the way that you crafted in the historical aspects of the war that was going on while your dad was going through his ordeal. I just want to say that men like your father and well, people like your mother and your father is what makes our country great. And it's the stories of those Americans like your parents that humble me greatly and inspire me to just keep going and to be in part of this great fabric of society that has come with a high cost. Your dad certainly put his time in and I'm just I'm happy to be part of the story. And dad, you know, I grew up thinking, you know, all my friends have heroes. Why don't I have a hero? When I was a child, to talk about what their hero is, so and so and so and so. And then when I finally, after dad died, I never really appreciated dad while he was here. I was only 19 when he, he was just my dad. When he died, I was 19. But after I got married, when I finally picked up his manuscript and read it from cover to cover, I had read chapters here and there. He wrote it over a period of about three years. When I read it all the way through, man, I realized what a great man he was. I understood what, why all his friends would tell me how special and how great he was and, and how good he was. And I realized right away, my dad is my hero. That's awesome. You know, and he did live the American dream. It's a great story. And to overcome such horrendous evil is a it's something that we all could take a look at because there's certainly some of that out there. And and if anybody's ever in the face of that, you know, Abram Korn, Abe's story, a Holocaust memoir is something that you may be able to rely on. May God bless your mother and father. I know the Thanksgiving holiday is coming up and I just wish your family, Joey, Godspeed and, and a safe holiday. And if there's anything we can do to help you on our end, we're here for you. And we just hope that we can continue to get the story out. And I just appreciate you and I appreciate your family. Thank you. And I'd also like to say I appreciate you 
and all members of the service to say thank you for your service just doesn't quite do it, you know, even though it's important to remember that. We wouldn't have this freedom if it wasn't for you. Dad wouldn't have this freedom if it wasn't for the American soldiers. I appreciate you pointing that out. Thank you, Joey. Thank you. You gotta light them up before they burn it down. Thank you for listening to another episode of Straight Outta Combat Radio, audio medicine from Green Zone Hero. If you liked what you heard, then tell others about us. Like us and download us. And please remember, freedom is not free, and combat veterans are vital assets. They're not broken. Save us all. Before they burn it down.